So what we're going to do today is I'm going to give you kind of a, uh, uh, in about 25 minutes, I'm going to give you a 10,000 year history of Houston <laughs> and bring it up to the current because I think that um, what I'm going to end up talking about is why history can be a living, um, a living thing, very much a living thing, as we try to resurrect historic landscapes, not just on the Katy Prairie, but in the middle of the city, including perhaps on this campus later this year. I'm very excited about that. I actually have two degrees from U of H, so I'm very excited to be back here. The library did not look like this when I went to U of H, uh, so I feel a little cheated. But with that, we're going to get into this. Anybody have an idea about this very beautiful and odd looking bird up here? Okay. You know, part of uh, what I'm going to get at is it's just nearly impossible to think about Houston's landscape um, from where we sit. We have so radically changed the ecology and the land shapes and landforms here in the greater Houston area, it's, it's really hard to imagine where we came from. This bird is a native Houston bird, was a native Houston bird. This is a Carolina parakeet. Last Carolina parakeet went extinct in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. It's likely that it probably went in extinct in the Houston area in the late 1800s. Um, it had a curious habit, a uh, very bad habit in its, in its uh, circumstance of, of grouping in, in flocks of 200 to 300 and attacking fruit orchards. So obviously that was not good and added to the fact that it had a homing, uh, it had a homing behavior that would take them back to where they started. So if uh, somebody was shooting them, they'd come back to the same group of trees and try to alight there. And so they were wiped out pretty much um, in this area in the late 1800s. So one thing that I'd like to point out is unlike all the wonderful historical research that we saw uh, earlier today, a lot of this natural history is spotty at best in the historical record because the, the, the folks who were the, the natural historians, many of which were German or English that came through here, came here a little bit later and they didn't do historic or uh, scientific research the way that we do it. They weren't quite as thorough. Some of the names have changed. So some of the animals I'm going to talk to that, and some of the ecosystems that have disappeared, we don't really know within maybe about 20 or 30 years about when they really disappeared in the area. We'll make some, we'll make some educated guesses based on some, some uh, things that we've found. All right. Quick framework on where I work. So everything in red is that great Midwestern prairie that where all that food that we eat comes from, a lot of the food that we, come from, uh, that we eat comes from. Um, the green patch down there, though, is our home prairie. And uh, oftentimes it's left off a of prairie map, so it's a pretty big space. So everything that you see in green there, except along the drainages, the waterways, was a grassland. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the vast majority of Texas, what we think about Texas, was a grassland. That's why we're such a great ranching state. Um, and that's important uh, in our conversation of these historical landscapes because if you take a look at and you added up all that acreage, this is a uh, historical landscape, the coastal prairie, which uh, at one time occupied more land than our eight smallest U.S. states. And yet very few people have heard about it, especially in Houston because we have so many folks who have been transplanted, but because the transformation of the land happened um, pretty quickly on and, and by now, we probably have, well, before the drought anyway, we probably have more trees in Houston than we ever have had in the last 7,000 years. So it's hard to put yourself in that place, but that's a very true thing. So if you look at Houston, everything in green, and this, this line moved back and forth, right? Uh, depending on whether there were dry years or wetter years, but that was all um, grassland for the most part. It was our signature landscape. Um, so, you know, there's some debate earlier on about whether we're a southern city or a western city. I think we're a little bit of both. Um, in fact, because there was so much luxuriant grassland here, you know, much of Harris County was ranched at one time. Um, so it's not surprising that we eventually, I know the rodeo wasn't a direct outgrowth of that ranching heritage, but it kind of rings true for me because we did have so, many, so much cattle production in the area. So where I work is the historic Katy Prairie, which is just that subsection of the coastal prairie in our area. Most of the Katy Prairie has been developed at this point, but that green region right there is where I work um, when I'm not working in the middle of the city. Um, and that's, uh, we've conserved about 20,000 acres of land. It is open to public visitation. So if you want to see a complex of historic landscapes for the Houston area, we have the largest remaining cattle ranch in the county, 6,500 6, acre cattle ranch called Warren Ranch. We have uh, rice fields that are still producing rice. 
And we have remnant, uh, both prairies and riverine forests that are reminiscent of the, what the settlers would have seen. So what we're trying to do is not have everything turn back the clock to you know, the 1820s. We're trying to have kind of a mosaic landscape to allow people to see how this area has developed over time, but also to serve as a, one of the last great wildlife refuges of our area. All right. So to understand Houston and Houston's history a little bit, you've got to go back, back, way back. This is what uh, much of our area looked like, um, you know, 13, 13 and a half thousand years ago. This was produced by the Houston Geological Society. Believe it or not, all these creatures lived here. And the reason I, th I say that you can't understand Houston's history without knowing this is that the mammoths and camels and um, other grazers that, that kept these grasslands open and formed this incredibly rich prairie soil, which would later go on to produce all the cotton that paid for much of the development of early Houston, including the railroad system and the banking system expansion. That was really set up in the Ice Age, way before we Europeans ever got here. Um, we know from uh, recent, um, uh, probably a lot of you guys know that when they were digging uh, uh, the new, or they were building the new road on Highway 99, that they uncovered some human remains there. Those human remains were found in association with some of these animals. So we know, we think about Houston as being a relatively new place, but I know from an ecosystem standpoint that people have been manipulating these ecosystems for over 10,000 years. So one thing I have to remember is that that is very true. In fact, I'm gonna pass this around. This is part of a mammoth tooth that we have found on a fossil dig that we're conducting right now. That's a Colombian mammoth, it's about 23,000 years old. And this other, other piece looks like it was just ripped off a tooth yesterday. This is actually part of a camel tooth, which is real interesting. But like I said, people had been here for a long time. So those are some actual era points. And these are some folks from the, uh, the archeological society, or the geological society sifting through some of the remains there on Highway 99. <coughs> so it's kind of, in a more definite way, pushed back kind of the habitation of this area. And what I mean by people had been manipulating this habitat and changing the ecosystems is, is, is this. We know that a lot of these folks were hunting large game, and there is very much a, a little bit of a debate, but um, I think it's headed towards kind of a more assurance that early Clovis people and, and folks uh, that were in and around the Southwest um, hunted many of these mammoths and things uh, to extinction. Now, there's some climatic reasons that that probably happened too, but in the process of doing that, they fundamentally changed the ecosystem. <coughs> You had these very large grazers that were opening things up, keeping open grasslands. Um, and so every time you take an animal out of an ecosystem, or you add an animal into an ecosystem, which is happening more and more, you change that ecosystem. And so uh, that's very important. So when the folks um, got here, um, you know, there were obviously several different attempts to colonize the area and explore the area. So Cabeza de Vaca got here to Galveston Island um, in the 15, early 1500s. Um, then there was some time period and there were some French settlements. But this is probably the best approximation of what we can think about as kind of a classic Houston landscape at the time of settlement. So let me go ahead and give you just a quick guide to what that is because it's not too many ecosystem types. So um, everything in this tan color was open grassland. These are the great forests of the north and these are these are really mixed forests of, of oaks, and, um, oaks and pines. So a lot of that pine, um, a lot of the timber industry, if you can think about this, this is kind of like the great thicket, or the big thicket right here. This is post oak savanna, so this is kind of a mixture of, of uh, grassland and forest. And these are the fringing kind of um, grass and marshes. And when people got here, we have to kind of put ourselves back in that mindset. It was truly an, an immense place. Um, if you think about the greater Houston area, it's bigger than some small countries. Um, there is a, a quote that, uh, from Daniel Shipman. He wrote this back in the early, or the mid uh, 1800s, just to give you an idea of how big this prairie was in particular. He said, bewildered in the wild and trackless prairie, I was lost, lost, lost. After wandering about in every direction, myself and horse without water for 30 hours, I began to seriously think that I should uh, last lie down and die in this untraveled wilderness, far away from my family and habitation of men, without a friend to close my eyes or dig my grave. 
there are many accounts of people getting lost. Um, some of these grasslands were almost treeless. They were plain-like. Um, the, the forests themselves, the reason it was called the big thicket is because those, uh, the particular type of vegetation is called tai tai or uh, racema flora, grows really tightly. So if you got off the trail here, if you got away from the mud roads like Eddie Weller was talking about, it's pretty easy to get lost. And there are still clues around Houston that this was the case. Ever see that street? Yeah. It's called that because everything that you saw from the shop windows south of there until you hit probably Bray's Bayou was all open prairie. And then from there, go down to Galveston and it's all open prairie. <clears throat> One thing that that map doesn't show is a comp almost completely extinct ecosystem that occurred here. Um, and very, very few people know about it. And we don't know about it as scientists very much because we, uh, it was eradicated so quickly. This is actually a native bamboo forest. This, this is called a cane break. And the cane breaks occurred all throughout the southeast. And, but they proved to be unbelievably fertile. So if you burned them and you ran cattle through them or you planted them, they'd be a really great asset to you. So great were they. And they, they, they were really fringing the edges of rivers that I can't take you to a good cane break in all of Houston. And in order to take you to a cane break that is very small, I'd have to take you to Brazoria National Wildlife Refuge. So this is something that almost undoubtedly would have been right in the middle of the city along some of our bayous and rivers, extinct ecosystem. So we're not even talking about uh, having a, um, uh, just an animal go extinct. And we've lost quite a bit of these animals uh, that were accounted for. That fish that you see on the far left, that's a sawfish. It's a type of shark that was still in Galveston waters in 1938. Uh, but when the settlers first got here, they were abundant in Galveston waters. So we think about some of these very tropical looking things um, being from Florida or places south, and they very much still are. But much of our wildlife was tropical in nature. We're a subtropical climate. We're very heavily influenced by, by central and, south and, um, and northern Mexico. So, um, you know, as we go through these pictures, you'll start to see some animals and you're like, I had no idea that was here. But we got to recognize, we got to put ourselves back in that time frame when, when habitats were unobstructed by barbed wire or other physical um, things. So this uh, one fish down here at the bottom looks a lot like a carp. It's something called a smallmouth uh, buffalo fish. Very common freshwater fish. Some people say that's why Buffalo Bayou is called Buffalo Bayou because there are some accounts that say that you could walk across the backs of these fish all the way across the bayou. So as we talk about these, these ecosystems and change, one thing to remember is that not only have the cast of characters changed, so we've lost some biodiversity, some species, but we've also lost a lot of abundance. So we still have many of our species, original species are still around. I'm working on a historical um, um, list for Harris County for vertebrates, but the numbers of them have changed greatly. So they talk about you know, dove uh, populations that were so large that it would take an hour to move overhead or um, you know, so many, so many fish, if you think about Buffalo Bayou, that you could seemingly walk across them. And I've been in rivers in Alaska when the salmon are coming in, and it really does look like that. So there have been a lot of changes to the ecosystems, and that has impacted the, the, the animals. So these are some animals that were lost probably very early, um, uh, relatively early on. They weren't lost mostly in the 1900s. Um, but really, most of them were probably got pushed out from us in the 1800s. That one bird at the very bottom is called an ivory-billed woodpecker. And they think that they may be found it in Arkansas several years ago. I'm not convinced. But it relies on really, really old um, wooded systems. So forest systems that are very old. It prefers things like cypress swamps. And when the settlers first got here, um, they talk about the fact that the, the forest was so dark, this rivering forest at Buffalo Bayou, that, that no sunlight could hit the water. Um, and what they probably found are species like cypress, uh, sycamores, pecans that were so old, in, in the case of cypress anyway, that they certainly could have been over a thousand years old. And and when you get to be a climax forest like that, it really does shade out just about everything. Now, I can't probably take you to a place like that in Texas because that wood is so valuable 
that a forester friend that I have said that every acre of, of woodland in Texas for the most part has been logged at least three to four times at this point. So w when those trees went all dead after the drought in the Houston Arboretum, was, oh, we've lost our, our ancient trees. That was clear cut during World War I. That, those trees were not relatively old from an ecological standpoint. Um, so we also lost that Carolina parakeet that I talked to you about. Now on the land, and this is a picture, by the way, and then you, a lot of you probably have seen that these are two um, early renditions of what those bayous might have looked like. And you can see, very tropical in nature, very southern in nature. It's got a lot of Spanish moss. Um, you can see in the distance on the left-hand side, lots of pine trees. The artist on this left-hand side uh, was really great. You can actually tell some of the species from this. Alligators. Very, very common sighting. Now, they're still in Buffalo Bayou, right? I've gone down in kayaks and seen alligators, but probably nothing like they were at that time. This is a picture of, just for Harris County, some of the species that we have mostly lost. So we've obviously lost uh, black bear, but we still have its namesake at Bear Creek. So um, this is something that was hunted by the Indians. Um, for many, many hundreds of years and traded with, um, they used it as, as, as trading goods uh, for trading with Indians further north. We still have one cougar still out on the Katy Prairie that we know of, maybe two, um, but rare. They're just starting to come back into the area. At that time though, it was a very common thing to hear a cougar calling at night with his characteristic call. And jaguar went all the way up into Arkansas um, and half the state. Um, we're not quite sure how common they were. Uh, ocelots, we think of them as being very South Texas. They went up all the way into Galveston. Um, and we still had diamondback rattlesnakes in the county when the settlers were first here. This is a species, though, that was lost relatively late. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, scientists rounded up the very last of our wolves. This was our native wolf. This is called a red wolf. And this was really the wolf of the southeast. This, this wolf went from central Texas all the way up into Virginia and all throughout the south. So we think about wolves as being kind of in the west and grizzly bears being kind of in the west. That's where we pushed them to. Those are the only places where they could survive. Gray wolves were very much a part of Texas. Lots of accounts of very large wolf packs. This wolf was a very social wolf. Um, and so that actually helped to lead to its demise. Ranchers were very afraid of this, this animal going after their herds. And so what they would do is they would mount their horses and they'd give chase and they'd run down the pack until they're exhausted because they didn't break apart because they were group, group members and family members. In fact, if you look at um, James J. Audubon, his, his, um, his rendering of a, of a red wolf in his mammals of North America is from Galveston Island. So very tied to the area. Um, it started to interbreed with coyotes and so we collected the very last ones. All right, so we talked about the immensity of this thing. And one thing, you know, the one thing I want to point out while I have some remaining time is, if you look at a soils map of any part of the world, but particularly in Texas, you can almost overlay the settlement pattern on top of that soils map in the 1800s, because that's where you were going to make your money. Where were you going to make your money? In particular, in this area, anywhere where you had these deep, rich alluvial soils or Blackland Prairie, so if you think about the Bryan College Station area, some of these areas in here, down in Brazoria County where they have those very deep, rich soils, well, that was great for cultivating this particular southern crop, right? So, you know, I think there are a lot of causative agents, and I certainly wouldn't argue this with anybody in terms of, uh, of uh, what weighed more for the Texas Revolution, but one of them was we wanted to get at those soils. That's what we wanted. These soils had developed over tens of thousands of years, with, in association with these large grassland animals that, that kept them healthy. So when we got here, we had a huge soil profile to grow cotton in and to make ourselves wealthy. So in a lot of ways, I, I do commend Houstonians on their incredible tenacity and brilliance and all that stuff, but we were left with those tremendous soil reserves and oil reserves from the Jurassic. You know, we just needed to exploit them in a certain sense, right? So we can't make that stuff on our own. Um, if you look at this, this is uh, called the Cotton Kingdom, and this is actually by uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who is a very prominent landscape architect. And he's showing you 
uh, the areas of densest cotton production. And if you lay that map over with the soils map, it shows you where people decided to settle in Texas. We didn't have an aerospace industry or medical industry at that time. We made their money off of agriculture like every other civilization had throughout history. And that's why a lot of the early um, uh, advertisements for the area were a lot like this. It says thousands of acres of richest soil at lowest prices. They talked about the weather. We kind of don't like the weather. Um, but they said it's warm, it's wet, and it's got great soil. You will make money. Come here. And this is repeated over and over again with these railroad advertisements, which are basically linking the richness of these prairie soils with the markets back in Houston and Galveston. That's basically what they're doing. And uh, I don't need to talk to you about how the role of King Cotton, um, but if you take a look at the railroad system in this area, that's, you know, in a very simplified way, was really to get goods and services out to these, these outside districts and also to get that prairie soil in the form of either livestock or cotton or something commoditizable and get them to market. In fact, if you take a look at the city seal, right, tells you three things, right? You're in Texas, you can get your goods to market, and there's rich soil right there. So, um, and, um, and I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna kind of zip through this. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll quickly say is that we think about Europeans getting here and they meet this virgin wilderness and then it starts kind of unraveling and changing and doing different things. That's not really, that's not really true in that, like I said, the Native Americans had been manipulating this area for a long time. The fire frequency right here at U of H in much of Houston was one to three years on average. An acreage would burn historically. That's a lot, it's a heavy fire regime. Um, and by the time the settlers first got here, these guys were already here in some form. They were already feral cattle and feral mustangs that had gotten loose from the Spanish, had started changing the ecosystem already. So when people say, are you trying to take it back to 1820 or 1836, you know, the land with these reconstructions. And I, and I tell them, I don't know what it was like because as Europeans, we had already started to alter the land through diseases that, that uh, made a lot of the Indians succumb to disease and through introduction of livestock accidentally. I'm gonna get to something real quick. I'm just gonna leave it with this. One of my roles is to resurrect historical um, landscapes. So this is a historical landscape. This is probably the most characteristic landscape that you would have seen here in Houston um, back in, in history. Everything, the earth was just pockmarked around here. This would have been U of H, the Astrodome, Herman Park, uh, mostly everything except for the far north. All of those pockets are wetlands. Those are called prairie potholes. And a lot of the white dots that you see were these little sand hills called pimple mounds. And so as we do our work, uh, and they're ancient, they're left over from the Pleistocene. But when agriculture, large scale agriculture came in and they started rice farming, they would fill the potholes in with the, with the pimple mounds. And so we go out there and Houston is flat, right? But it wasn't really flat. <laughs> this is why people say that Houston was built on a swamp. Because the early settlers didn't distinguish between a very wet prairie and a wooded swamp, which is what a swamp is. That's why people say it was built on a swamp. It was a very wet prairie system for the most part. There were swamps around here. So if you look and you bring it forward, that's what it looks like and kind of the landscape signature has been let out. Now, if you go to Google Earth, uh, which is available online for free, pictures for Harris County go all the way back to 1944 when most of the city was not developed. So if you live in a newer neighborhood, especially on the west side or the north side or Pearland or you can actually see what kind of activity was happening on that land. So one of the things that we're doing, and I'll, I'll finish up with this real quick, is we are trying to bring back historical landscapes on the periphery of the city. And this is a time lapse of a project we have at a place called the Indian Grass Preserve, where we're actually using old aerial photography to dig out where those potholes were. Already those potholes are maybe a year old, and you'll see an aerial here in a second. Already uh, wetland birds have been born there. Bald eagles have been hunting these holes already for ducks last fall, um, which is fabulous. So you can see that what we're trying to do is recreate these historic landscapes. And we're doing it also in the middle of the city. So we have a program called the Prairie, the, the, um, Prairie Builder Schools and Parks Program. 
And we're helping agencies like Buffalo Bayou Partnership, Herman Park Conservancy, Memorial Park Conservancy, MD Anderson Cancer Center. So there's nine acres of prairie now back in the Texas Medical Center. Uh, two acres at Holcomb and Fannin, if you want to see what the medical center looked like. And so um, what we're trying to do is just to get people to say, history matters, ecology matters. These are two bedrocks of what we are as a people. Everything's changing all the time, but there are these deep currents. And this is one of those deep currents, the ecology. So with that, I'm going to take questions real quick, and then we'll switch it over, if that's OK. Yes, ma'am. Did you say it was the red box or the gray box that, that was negative to? Red, wolf, red wolf. I mean, red wolf. Yeah, red wolf. So it was a distinct species that wasn't as big as gray wolves, but wasn't as small as coyotes. And, and, the, and the one that Audubon uh, painted, he found on Galveston? Yeah, yeah. Because at that time and during the, this, this pre-1860 period, they were very common. Um, many, many of the, of the accounts, even up to the early 1900s, they were still common in this area. Yes, ma'am. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, what happened was that the red wolves became so few in number. There used to be a place called uh, Wolf Corner over here um, where a retired dairyman would go out and shoot red wolves and pin them to a, to a fence. Well, at one point he stopped finding them because there were so few in number and he was just putting up big coyotes. But at some point, the coyotes and the red wolves, because the red wolves were so few, started interbreeding. And they, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't want the thing to go extinct. And so they collected wolves here in coastal Texas, and they also collected them in southwest Louisiana, where the two remaining populations were, took them off to the Carolinas for a breeding program, and they, that breeding program is still ongoing. They have told us we'll never get red wolves back. We just don't have the right kind of habitat anymore. Is there any other wolves? Mm -hmm. What? Local? No, the red wolf was really our endemic local wolf. Um, up in North Texas, they would have had gray wolves. Yes. Uh, you say it's prairie, prairie grass. How tall was it typically? Uh, it was so tall, well, it depended on the time of the year, right? But at this time of the year, in September, October, it was so tall that people a lot of times had to get up on their horses in their, in their stirrups to look out over it. So we have the, the king of the prairie grasses around here, and we have some of this at, at the Anderson Prairie, which is publicly accessible if you want to go check it out. You know, it can get up to 10 feet tall um, and have a root system that goes down 12 feet. Um, the root system was so thick that you'd actually have to, for an acre of, of prairie, if you actually dried out all the root system on one of these really productive prairies, it would weigh as much as a school bus. Tremendously fertile soil and very rich place. So as soon as they invented this, the steel plow and they could break into that, some of the best farmland on planet Earth. And now that ecosystem which we're building back, only about less than 1% of it is in pristine condition. It's almost gone extinct. Yes? How far back do the trees, uh, like in the Memorial Park area? Uh -huh. No, not all of it. It was a, it was a very complicated uh, area. So along Buffalo Bayou, along most of the drainages that were around here, either bayous or rivers, there were these beautiful riparian forests that were very uh, ancient. Yeah, exactly. And or those cane breaks. Um, and then there were outshoots of pine belts uh, out into the prairie. So there's a place called Piney Point. That was a pine belt that petered out into the Katy Prairie right there. That's why they called it Piney Point. So uh, not every place in Memorial Park was a prairie. If you go to the Memorial Park um, uh, Conservancy's website, they have a master plan. And that master plan, what we try to do is, is put the right kind of vegetation on the right soil. So the trees, um, the tree mortality on the prairie soil in Memorial Park was 80 to 90%. The prairie took back what it had given. On the places where it used to be forest, it was 5 to 10% mortality. So it's a mixture of land uses in Memorial Park. Real complicated, real interesting, but a heavy fire regime at one point. We can see the, the burn char marks down, low down the roots. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is a good segue. Sure. I was going to ask, you mentioned that the fire frequency was one to three years. Yes, ma'am. During, at what time are you talking about? That's, that is really, actually, that's, that's pre-heavy so European settlement. And the reason we can find that out is we can go pretty deep in the soil and find the charcoal. 
Um, but we believe that the Native Americans, the Karankawa, the Bidai, the Tonkawa later on, and, and the other uh, tribes that are around here, use fire extensively. If there were anything like some of the other Indians in Texas and in the Midwest where they had prairies, they were extensive fire starters. And that's why this notion of kind of people being separate, what I would say is that humans have always been one of the keystone species in the coastal prairie, which has been around for about 7,000 years, different kind of grassland before that. And humans had been here for that. So they've been a keystone species from the very beginning. Yeah, yes ma'am. Sugar cane, but yes. I don't think that's the cane that you're talking no. about here. What kind of this is a native form of bamboo. It's an American bamboo. And so um, it very, very thick. Um, it was a very dangerous place to go into. There's a rattlesnake called a cane break rattlesnake that was at one point all over Harris County. It really liked to frequent that. So a lot of the early settlers not only wanted to graze their cattle there, but they wanted to burn it out because there was quite a few rattlesnakes in there. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. My love, actually my obsession with Houston history, began in 1998 when at a garage sale in the garage, I purchased a box of papers. In that box of papers turned out to be a Houston diary from 1869, handwritten by a local girl who 10 years later, her father's the first reconstruction mayor in Houston, Andrew Jackson Burke. So at first I thought I had Sam Houston's daughter's diary. So I ran to the HMRC and found out same name, Nettie, Nettie Houston Bringhurst, but her name was Nettie Burke Bringhurst, but it didn't dissuade me from spending the next 10 years obsessed with her family, which led to obsessions with other local families in that time period, 1860 to 1900. When I first began to write the book for Arcadia Publishing, all my colleagues said, what? There are no photographs from that time period. So that in itself was quite a wonderful quest. And uh, so my topic today is Houston, 1860 to 1900. There you go. The population was 4,845. There, there was one huge yellow fever epidemic in 1867. And of course, the 1860s were the war years here in Houston, or here in Texas, and everywhere else. Buffalo Bayou's steamboat era reached its zenith in that decade. The richest man in the county was William Marsh Rice. One of his several businesses was hauling ice from Houston from New England to Houston from New England by ship. Over 115,000 bales of cotton pass through our town annually. Houston was a growing rail center with five short rail lines and over 350 miles of track. At least nine Houston merchants reported taxable holdings of over $250,000. The city experienced two disastrous fires, one destroying $350,000 worth of property. If you had to go buy supplies for your family, this is where you would end up first, Market Square. Market Square is bound by Travis, Milam, Congress, and Preston. It was donated, the, the land on which it was built was donated to the city by the Allen family. This location is across today from where La Carafe is. Now stand, and La Carafe is reported to be one of the oldest structures in Houston. Our city grew up out and around this open air market. If you were traveling in Market Square, this would be a gentleman you'd most likely bump into who's, I don't think he is as well known as he ought to be. William Robinson Baker was a Houston mayor, Texas state legislator, and railroad official from New York. He moved to Texas in 1837, worked at a, as a bookkeeper for the Houston Town Company. Baker was a land dealer, and in 1860, his, he had real property valued at 300,000, personal property worth 75,000. By 1874, 
He was elected as a Democrat to the state Senate and served as mayor of Houston. He purchased an interest in the Houston Post in 1883 and was president of the City Bank of Houston. Now, one of the other very interesting men was Thomas M. Bagby. I personally really like Mr. Bagby. It's sad how, how, how short he lived, too, because he could have done anything. He could have been president of the United States. He really could have been. Thomas Bagby, Houston businessman and civic leader, was born in Virginia. And I think it's important to reflect on everyone's coming from out of town. Okay, I, li I like that idea. He arrived also in Texas in 1837, and within three years he was a prosperous cotton merchant. He was one of the nine original members of the Houston Public Library, and the Julia Idison Building stands on the site of the former Bagby home. In 1866, he helped found the Houston Direct Navigation Company, and in 1867, he was put in the position of president of the First National Bank. Now look at him, he dies in the first decade, right, that we're talking about. But if you were to research him and go to the primary source research at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center, you will find some incredible things on him, including amazing pictures donated by one of his descendants. Now, what was the First National Bank? Oh, I'm sorry, this is his city directory. The first time the city directory in Houston was printed was the 1866 city directory, and here was an ad he took out. This is a picture of the First National Bank chartered in Houston. This is a picture taken in 1902. The First National Bank was chartered by B.A. Shepard. At first it was called Shepherd's Bank and he owned the building here. He was an excellent, excellent businessman himself. After the Civil War, state and nationally chartered banks were sanctioned for the first time in Texas. Before the war, B.A. Shepherd was hailed as one of the first bankers in Houston in this building shown here. Although people will say that Dick Dowling and the Bank of Bacchus was one of the first banks. <laughs> it probably was if you think a bank is just exchanging money for goods. So, Most Texans in the era of the Republic through the end of the Civil War did not support the establishment of chartered banks. But this did not preclude savvy businessmen at the time from operating a private lending system. Mr. Benjamin A. Armistead Shepherd, his family later donated the money for the Shepherd School. They've been great philanthropists. He was very generous to two or three churches. Towards the end of his life, he spent a lot of his time donating and be, being philanthropic. And he was very happy with his appearance because when he had his own bank, his picture was on the bill. <laughs> and I have a friend who's one of his descendants. Honestly, it took me 10 years to find one of those bills. 10 years, because they are so rare. He was born in Virginia in 1814. He was arguably, arguably the most prominent and enduring money lender in early Houston. This is an interior of the bank in 1902. Now, one of the gentlemen that I really enjoy getting to know through my research was W.D. Cleveland. He was so good looking when he was in the war, I'm sorry. But he was timeless, and his descendants are still walking the streets of the city today, which I really like it when people are, just stay here when they get here. He had the great fortune to have a magnificent location at the foot of Main Street for his import-export cotton business. His warehouse at the foot of Main Street was the biggest warehouse to date. Cleveland was the second president of the Cotton Exchange and Board of Trade. He advertised that, quote, superior advantages in freights to and from this place make it the cheapest and best location for all classes of merchandise. 
Now, all I can think about is all these gentlemen like meeting and having intense conversations about what are we going to do for Houston now? What are we going to bring in? What are we? I mean, I really can see them doing that. It's almost history when you research is almost like diving into the time period and escaping for hours. Now, he married a most beautiful woman, Justina Latham Cleveland. These are her children, and this is a picture that came from a article written in the Cincinnati Inquirer. Okay, so the article was written by from Long Branch, a reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer writing from Long Branch, observed the Cleveland family on vacation. Quote, W.D. Cleveland, the Houston millionaire, who's at the Ocean Hotel with his wife, six children, and three nurses. <coughs> they are about to leave for the White Mountains. Think of such a snug little family party. Quote, end quote. Now, Jill, now here's what I love about following family lines. Her great-granddaughter became a Bond woman. In fact, she was a Bond woman in Goldfinger. She's beautiful still. Justina's father was a famous captain, sea captain, and importer, exporter, and all kinds of things. And his name was Ludovic Latham. Lodovic. Lodovic. L-O-D-O-Vic. And this is his, a picture of his business. If you want to see his portrait, I encourage you to go down to the Heritage Society and go to the Nichols Rice Cherry home where they have his portrait and his wife's hanging up. He owned the Latham Furniture at the corner of Maine and Capitol. This was one of the largest hardware stores in Houston. Latham was a seasoned sea captain and blockade runner with business matters that took him as far as China, the West Indies, and ports of Europe. Now, if you wanted to keep up on the local news, you'd read the Texas Telegraph. This gentleman here was the third editor of the Texas Telegraph. E.H. Cushing was born in Vermont and moved to Houston in 1856. During the Civil War, he was forced on occasion to use butchers, papers, and wallpaper to keep his presses running. He held regular salons, entertaining the likes of Ashbel Smith, Sam Houston, and our special poet laureate, Molly Moore, at his 20-acre estate named Bohemia. Now, the love for Houston and the love for education trickled down throughout his family when this little tyke became, actually saved Texas A&M from being absorbed by the college system. This is Edward Benjamin Cushing. Are there any Aggies in the room? The Cushing Library was named for this gentleman. True to his father's name, he was a proponent of education. He attended at Texas A&M in 1880 and is credited with saving it 32 years later. In 1912, Cushing stood alone against the nearly overwhelming forces attempting to close the tiny agricultural and mechanical college of Texas. He, grad he guaranteed Texas A&M's notes with his personal funds to obtain credit and remain in operation. His extensive engineering book collection was donated to what became the Cushing Memorial Library. Now another famous family in this uh, reconstruction decade in Houston was the House family. And this is a beautiful young girl who married into the House family. This beauty, this Bastrop-born beauty, arrived in Houston in 1869 on a stagecoach with her new husband and left quite a legacy. Ruth Nicholson House married Houston banker T.W. House Jr. Her devotion to Houston and the well-being of its citizens accompanied by the House family fortune made our current YWCA possible. Her husband, T.W. House Jr., the son of English baker and then Houston millionaire, was a popular businessman in Houston. His occupation listing while serving on the Houston City Council was owner private bank, cotton broker, and president Houston Gas Light Company, vice president Houston Water Company, vice president Houston East and Texas Radio, Ra Railroad. 
Now, when you're doing historical research, when you happen upon a slide like this, you scream for joy. That is an actual shot of an 1869 stagecoach in motion from the family archives. Really, I almost fell on the floor when I saw it. And what it is is those two people riding from their marriage to Houston. Isn't that great? And um, all of these came from a woman named Sally K. Marshall Weems. And she happened to let me have her five scrapbooks and take them home, which is unbelievable. And I scanned every single image, high quality, eight and a half by 11, TIFF file, because it was that cool. It took a long time. But there they are. And can you imagine getting married and then having a 10 ride, bumpy, dusty trip in your wedding dress to Houston? <laughs> Holy Toledo. Did you know Ruth Nicholson House was beautiful her whole life? They have pictures of her even like 80, and she was beautiful. Now, the second generation, the girls who were born in the 1850s in Houston, came alive and started to be seen in their teens. Right here you will see Nettie Burke, the girl who started it all, about the age she was when she wrote the diary I found, with her buddy, Nellie Bagby, daughter of T.M. Bagby. This carte de vis photo was in the archives. I bought six carte de vis photo albums at that same estate sale. And honestly, unbeknownst to me what I was buying, I was really blind buying, and that's good fortune, I think. I kept the entire um, archive together, too and I felt it important. Anyway, this was from one of Nettie's Cartivis photo albums where, interestingly enough, I tracked down her great-great-niece who was 85 and came to my house with a third album who, that had everyone's name on the back of it. I couldn't believe it, like below the picture. When does that happen? Never. This is the diary, a page out of the diary. It's, it's little, it's only 100 pages, and, but guess what, it's 25 hours reading it to yourself and then typing it, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> and then learning how to read her writing, look at it. But, and I wish I'd had like, the battle was this, or, and there's nothing, I mean, she was 15, right? But there was one passage I truly liked, and I hope you'll, you'll enjoy it also. And it is. Tom Lockhart, a very nice boy loved by all who knew him, was taken from this sinful world with a very sudden and painful death. He wrote a note to Luella Hancock and asked her to go to the circus with him. He was going to take her and my brother Ed, and her brother Ed, but, and Ed was going to take me and we were all going together. But Luella's sister's baby was very sick and she couldn't go with him. So he came here after Ed, and they just went off together to the circus. And Ed said he was so full of life, so full of fun, and just as cheerful as he could be that night. He lived about two miles from town. He came here and hitched his horse, and when he came from the circus, it was one o'clock. Now, here, here, here is where the Millie Esperson building is now. Her father owned the entire block. And he bought it in 1848 for $300. <laughs> Okay, okay. It was one, at one o'clock he came here and got his horse and Ed opened the gate for him. He bid Ed goodnight and went off by himself. When he got to Allen's station, which was about a half mile from his home, he overtook a friend and two other men who were on horseback together and one was drunk. He said to the man on horseback, who is that drunken man on behind you? And the drunken man heard him, jumped down off his horse, and before Tom knew anything about what he was doing, stabbed him so that he died a short after so he died a short time after poor dear. All I hope for now is that he is with Jesus in that beautiful home on high, and I pray to my dear sweet Jesus. So I was curious as to how calling someone drunk would make them kill you. So I talked to people and did a little research and found out that in that time period, an insult like that between two men would be very, very bad. And the guy was probably a drunk. But anyway, so do you know, the Mexican circus was one of the ways people had fun. And here's a postcard of what they came to Houston and did, and they came every year. And um, 
Okay, so let's go on to 1870. We have a population of 9,332 9, people, refrigerated railroad cars, and the Texas State Fair came to Houston. Harris County had 64 manufacturing establishments employing 583 laborers. Congregation Beth Israel established the first synagogue at Franklin and Crawford. The first 300 Chinese immigrant laborers arrived in Houston, and Texas during the 1870s was readmitted to the Union. Okay, remember T.W. House and his wife? Well, here's their house. <laughs> at 1010 Louisiana, out of the same personal archives. Isn't that beautiful? It employed the entire block, and they had, of course, two or three um, household people and a gardener. And the gardener, what was it? this beautiful home was built at 1010 Louisiana, 1872. In the House Family Papers, their gardener, James Goggin, wrote his description. The garden contained every vegetable known to man with a fig orchard and a pecan grove and palms 30 feet high. So Houston, because of our wonderful lush weather, has some magnificent foliage in the downtown area in the 1870s. Now inside the TW House house, you might want to spend time in the parlor. Now do you all remember the picture of him as a young guy? Well, guess what happened between then and now? He was hunting, jumped a fence, the gum blew off a side of his face just about, but he survived. So you will never see him again front place. In fact, I think I saw one in the scrapbook. I didn't even scan it because why do that? But um, the, the House family were of English descent and really liked tea time. And I have a friend who's a, a descendant, and she said she remembers her whole family always having grapes on the table and breaking for tea. This beautiful Victorian parlor, hold on. It exhibited the house family life, a tradition from their English heritage. And you can see their daughters. You can see the, the, the uh, light is a kerosene filled lamp that comes on top of the table from the, I don't know where it comes from, but. That's an awfully beautiful thing. Uh, in the family collection, I also have pictures of all the girls' bedrooms, and it's magnificent. Now, they did have uh, Eliza Scott. I found Eliza Scott in the 1870 city census, and she's standing here in front of, in front of a, um, the house family and the house family building and holding two of the children. I don't know much more about her, and I'd really like to. So this is a view of Travis Street from the same time period. OK, if you, uh, as, we, as I said earlier, you know, in, during the 1860s, the city of Houston really had two horrible fires. And so they kind of amped up their fire department. Uh, it was no longer the bucket brigade that everyone would do buckets all the way down the street and hopefully help it. They had actual firehouses and firemen. And so this is firehouse number five at McKinney and Nance. Now what was so unique about this firehouse is the fact that, say what? It's in 1975, that was the first one? That was number five. The, the reason why I'm having it is because it's the first time they had a dormitory where people stayed overnight, like as in today. And bef you know, this is one of the first times that there, it was no longer voluntary. They actually paid them. Now this is uh, Nettie Burke growing up in, in her wedding, wedding photo in 1879, the same year her father is appointed or elected mayor of Houston. Her brother-in-law was Edward Hopkins Cushing. Okay, so if you lived in Houston in 1870, where would you go to post your mail, get put in jail, or buy your food? Look at that beautiful building. 
This is uh, 1879. The por this post office was built in a Moorish style by the U.S. Treasury Department architects. The beautiful Harris County Jail. Now, if your child got sick, you were kind of up a creek. So the early Presbyterian women had an association where they did a cookbook, but a cookbook that told you how to take care of other things, like how to wash your hair. It's very cool. It was printed in 1879. So, this, oh, uh oh, hmm, I left it out. Just a second. Sorry, guys. <coughs> so what happened? What, 1880. Oh, I'm ahead of myself, but it's sorry. Okay, we'll get to that in two seconds. Okay, on into the next decade, 1880. Remember the last time, in the last decade, it was only 9,000 inhabitants, and now we're already up to 16,000. Okay, so in 1883, the first Presbyterian church made a cookbook, but this was owned by the House family. What happened was they were returning from a visit north, and one of their daughters got ill on the sleeper car. And by the time they got home, she was near death. And so this was a... They, they wanted to figure out what to do for coughing. And so here was a recipe to give her a certain thing for it, but it, I think they thought it actually killed her. And when I found this, I was like, whoa, what a great historic thing. Okay, if you went to shop, you'd go to Hanky and Pilot. And then you can see a lot of people would be waiting on you a lot, and there's no self-checkouts. If you needed to get anything made for you or altered or buy clothing, you would go to Levi Brothers at 319 Main. Levi Brothers Mercantile Business occupied this four-story building, which room, and there was a room actually four tailors set up. By 1879, they employed 400 Houstonians. And this is a really cool picture of the workroom. <coughs> One of my favorite buildings in town that you can still see today is a Houston Cotton Exchange. It was designed by Eugene Heiner, who designed a lot of buildings over, I think, oh, at least 40 or 50 Texas-wide. He was amazing. And this one was built by James Lucas. Now, James Lucas came here from Nottingham, England, actually from Sherwood Forest, and his real name was James Sherwood Forest. And his biggest claim to fame was his first building and helping to start a brickyard and helping to pave half of the streets in Houston. He died in 18, he died in, in 1894, I think. And um, after that, his son continued his work. And I'm gonna have to give you a five minute warning. Really, okay, good. Okay, all right, so look at that. 100 bales of cotton across, the land, across downtown. This is how we shipped it before we built the ship channel. This was the first building in Houston who had an elevator inside, and one of the first times that people actually had ready to make, sold ready to wear clothing. This is Shepherd's Dam. It was a financial bomb created when David Shepherd wanted to build a grist mill and instead he had a wonderful swimming hole that people enjoyed for a long time. But Shepherd's Drive is named for David Shepherd. If you wanted to eat out, you could get steaks or beer or soup at this place, Little Jim. If you wanted to learn art, you could go to the Victorian art classes and this also was a huge time for women in Houston because all kinds of women's organizations were being formed, built, and, and this is Samuel Brashear, mayor, and he was so wonderful to the city of Houston because he donated 20 acres of land for the Heritage Society downtown and created the first park that people could actually go to for free and have swimming or parties or, it had 4,000 visitors every summer. Sorry, this is fast now. Okay, this person is important to me because her family later donated the log cabin 
to old place, to the Heritage Society. This is a picture of Eugene Pilat. And what he had in Pilat's opera house, he brought people like Maurice Barrymore, Lily Langtree. I mean, he really brought the continental U US to Houston. And then his son owned this wonderful yacht that during one of the wars it was taken by our government to help in the... This woman uh, was married to the man who founded Seabrook, and she uh, organized the third, the fourth Texas DAR group and the first in Houston called the Lady Washington Society in Rice Hotel in the Crystal Ballroom in 1898. And right now, there's actually a, a Texas historical marker about that hanging on the front door. OK, very few things on 1900. Look at, what was the last 16,000? 10 years, 44,000. That OK, you know what? In the beginning of Houston, there were so many magnolia groves, hundreds of magnolias. But the urban sprawl kind of cut that. But a lot of people traveling would write about the wonderful waft of magnolia during with their windows open in the hotels downtown. This is where Nino's restaurant is today. And John Palazzo was a kerosene salesman for Gulf Oil. Every day he'd take his thing 10 miles a day and sell all over Houston. His descendant is Sammy Patronella, who owns Patronella's restaurant. So they stayed, and they still own the land where Nino's is. This is what the Rice Hotel looked like when the Lady Washington chapter was founded in 1898. Good thing I, I'm going so fast. Good thing I know the material I don't need. <laughs> oh, gosh. If anyone knows Mickey Lex Norton, this is her ancestor who actually had the first, said to be the first Cadillac in town in 1902. Mickey, uh, Mickey Norton does a lot is one of the founders of the uh, Houston History Alliance and is a true proponent of the philanthropy of Houston's history and works diligently. Okay, in uh, 1905, James Lucas' son, Alfred T. Lucas, built the Houston City Hall for George Dickey. Again, an example of people staying here, continuing living here, even though it's hot, right? It can be very miserable. But there's something about Houston and the way people treat you, that just makes you stay. In closing, I want to say, upon arrival, whether it was from international voyages or continental train trips, Houston became home to all individuals quickly. I was not born here, but both my children were. <laughs> Houston welcomes newcomers with open arms and famous Southern hospitality. From 1860 to 1900, we were a vibrant city, and into today, we continue to push away adversity and muster forward. And I want to thank you very much. Thank you.